On any given day, we have a number of frequent encounters with elderly individuals who are struggling physically. And our first reaction might be one of sympathy and appreciation for the struggles that they're going through. But let's face it, on days when you're in a rush and you end up potentially behind one of these individuals that's not moving as quickly as you would really appreciate, there's that little piece of us deep down which might lose our patience. This is not meant to be funny. The elderly population is an exploited population, including in the field of medicine. When we deal with elderly individuals and feel that they're not moving as quickly as we would really appreciate, we do have a tendency to become frustrated and lose our patience. And let's face it, in an elderly population, when faced with this impatience, well, they have a tendency to be just as frustrated with us. The problem is there's a number of physical changes that naturally occur with age, which makes it difficult for these individuals physically. And we really have to develop an appreciation for what elderly individuals encounter on a daily basis to be able to understand precisely what they're going through. That's the purpose of this lecture. We're gonna be looking at a number of normal pathological changes that occur in a number of the muscular and bone and connective tissue systems that make it difficult for these individuals. Looking at how each of these pathological changes will account for the physiological changes. And ultimately, we're basically getting to a spot where we can gain an appreciation for the functional limitations that an elderly population, particularly those beyond 70 years of age, will encounter on a daily basis. I guess you can sum up this entire talk by saying that growing old sucks. And the only really good thing that can be said about it is that hopefully we all live long enough to experience exactly how terrible it can be. Let's start off by looking at bone density. It's pretty well established that there's going to be a progressive loss in bone mineral density beyond the fifth decade of life and physiological changes to explain this. First of all, there's something called the WNT signaling pathway. And this tends to be important in the differentiation of osteoblasts, being able to um, allow them to divide and to be able to function. It works through this system called beta-catenin, which when the levels are increased, promotes osteoblast differentiation and also suppresses osteoclasts. So the overall result is going to be an increase in bone density. Now, this is inhibited by a protein known as sclerostin, which is held in check with another protein called SIRT1. So if you lose SIRT1, then you will end up in an inhib inhibition of the WNT pathway, and that's gonna have negative consequences on bone mineral density. In addition, we have hormonal changes as well. One of the most well-established changes is with estrogen. Estrogen tends to have an inhibitory effect on osteoclastic activity, so increased estrogen levels are associated with increased bone mineral density. We do notice a significant decline in estrogen with age, particularly past the fifth decade, that results in a decrease in bone density. We talk about this quite a bit in the female population, but the same sort of thing is seen in a male population as well, because estrogen does serve as a precursor for testosterone production. There's also a change in IGF-1 levels. IGF-1 is known to stimulate production of osteoprogenitor cells and osteoblasts, so uh, with an age-related decline in IGF-1 cellular sensitivity, meaning the receptor just isn't as sensitive to it anymore, we do receive a, um, a concurrent loss in osteoblastic production. In considering bone density, and really all connective tissue for that, tissues for that matter, we do also have to consider mesenchymal stem cells. Now, this is a pluripotent stem cell population that will give rise to your osteoprogenitor cells and eventually osteoblasts, which we just discussed. 
but it will also give rise to a number of other connective tissue cells as well. With age, we see a decrease in the proliferative capacity of the stem cell population. Looking specifically at the cells, we see an increase in cytoplasmic granulation, which represents an accumulation in waste protein product, and also an increase in P53, uh, P50, or P21, and beta-galactosidase levels, which tend to promote cellular senescence. So as a result, we see a decrease in the number of osteoblasts being produced in this um, cell population. But we also see alter, alternate pathways take place. So there's a bit more adipogenesis that's going to increase. So we do see an age-related increase in bone marrow fat content, for example. We can also look at the downstream differentiation of osteoblasts that ultimately form the osteocytes that maintain the bone environment. Now, these serve as the principal mechanoreceptor in our bone tissue and release factors in response to stress that help to maintain our bone environment, promoting repair. Therefore, an age-related loss of osteocytes, which is noticed, uh, it does occur as due to apoptosis, and that's going to have negative implications on the pre-existing bone environment and this mechanotransduction pathway, which leads to the stimulation of bone-preserving hormones. So a loss of this is going to have a negative effect on bone density as well. Next, we're going to take a look at articular cartilage. We see a number of changes in articular cartilage with age. First of all, there's going to be an overall decrease in water content. We also see proteoglycan changes. There's going to be fragmentation of agrican, which is a cartilage-specific proteoglycan core protein, and altered sulfation patterns, which are going to change the entire biomechanics of the articular cartilage. We also notice changes in our collagen levels increased cleavage by collagenase enzymes, and an alteration in cross-linking, which is also going to change the quality of the articular cartilage. Finally, we can also look at chondrocytes in the articular cartilage. Chondrocytes tend to have a decrease in sensitivity to IGF factor, and that's once again going to result in cellular senescence in these cell populations. This could be related to greater oxidative stress and the production of reaction oxygen species. There is a tendency for there to be decreased oxygen tension because of the changes in the biomechanics of the articular cartilage with age. It makes it, left stiff, it, makes it more difficult for oxygen to be able to diffuse to the deeper levels of the cartilage for the chondrocytes to be able to pick up. Um, it also might be related to interference uh, with tyrosine phosphorylation within receptors in the cellular membrane. As a result, we also see a decreased number of total chondrocytes, a decrease in their synthesis because of the loss of the mesenchymal stem cells, as well as increased rates of apoptosis. That's going to result in loss of chondrocytes and the formation of asbestiform cartilage. Um, which will also have a negative impact on the overall health and quality of the cartilage. Next up, we can take a look at tendons. Once again, this stems from a mesenchymal stem cell population, and with the loss in mesenchymal stem cells, we're going to see a decrease in the total number of tendon-producing cells, or tenocytes. So we have this loss of tenocytes, but we also have age-related changes in the tenocytes that are still around. Um, this is due to a decreased, we see decreased rates of protein synthesis, for example. And it's important to note that these tenocytes are responsive to mechanical stress and help to maintain the tendon environment. So a loss and a change in the protein production in the existing tenocytes is going to have a negative effect on the overall structure and the biochemical, or sorry, the biomechanical properties of the tendon itself. 
So looking more specifically at the changes in the extracellular matrix, there's going to be age-related changes, including increased collagen density, because a decrease in GAGs, water, and chondroitin found within the tendon. The collagen that does exist is going to have less organization, so there's a decrease in the parallel structure of these fibers. And we also observe increases in degradative enzymes within the matrix environment, including matrix metalloproteinases, which are going to lead to a breakdown within the tissue. The overall result is a decrease in tensile strength and increased microtrauma found within the tendon that makes it more susceptible to injury. Finally, you're also going to see an age-related decrease in the vascular supply, which will limit the nutrients coming to the tendon, which will also have a negative effect on overall tendon health. Next up, we're going to take a look at ligaments. Similar to what we saw with tendon, we also see degradative changes within the ligaments themselves. Again, these result from a mesenchymal stem cell population, so we are going to notice these age-related decrease in the number of ligamentocytes. The ligamentocytes that are there are also going to be producing altered protein patterns. So we do see, once again, collagen disorientation, similar as what we saw in tendons. Particularly, this has been studied in the ACL of elderly populations. We also notice a decrease in the number of mechanoreceptors. This includes proprioceptive feedback in Golgi tendon organs. And so consequently, this might have an effect on overall balance in an elderly population. Next, we move on to intervertebral discs. To begin with, it should be noticed that the intervertebral discs are already relatively avascular. They're highly dependent on the capillary network within the superior and inferior vertebral bodies to receive a, a large degree of their nourishment through diffusion and through constant unloading and reloading during the day. Looking at the nucleus pulposa, it contains these nucleopopocytes derived from our notochordal, sorry, notochordal progenitor cells. And these are the cells that are responsible for secretion of the extracellular matrix. The notochordal progenitor cells will serve as a stem cell line for the replacement of our nucleopopocytes. And once again, with age, we do see a decrease in their number. Looking at the annulus fibrosis itself, the inner region tends to be rich in chondrogenic cells, while the outer portion contains a larger concentration of fibroblasts. The annulus fibrosis cells are also sensitive to mechanical stretch and are also regulated by growth factors. So in an elderly population, we have these decreased permeability of the cartilage end plates. Now, as just stated, this is where a lot of the nutrient supply for the intervertebral discs comes from. And so consequently, restrictions in diffusion from the vascular bone to the avascular intervertebral discs are expected to have morphological changes to the intervertebral disc. As just stated, we have an overall decrease in the notochordal progenitor cell population, which is going to alter the survival and proliferation of the nucleopulposites. This will ultimately have an effect in the degradation of collagen and prostaglandins within the nucleus pulposa and will affect the overall biomechanics of the nucleus pulposa. This decline in notochordal progenitor cells also has an effect on the um, overall health of the annulus fibrosis as well. We see age-related losses in the type 2 collagen network, and the collagen fibers that do still exist tend to become thinner and more irregular with age. 
we have an accumulation of structural damage over time, which can be thought of as cracks in the foundation of the annulus fibrosus, which accounts for a lot of the age-related disc degeneration that is noted and an increased susceptibility to disc herniation in this, pos in this population. Next up, we need to take a look at skeletal muscle. The big age-related change that we see in skeletal muscle, uh, we utilize a term called sarcopenia, which literally means the loss of flesh. Now, this is a medical term that generally describes the age-related loss in muscle mass, and this happens independent of any disease factors that may exist. We just see an overall decrease in skeletal muscle with age. Typically, we notice gradual losses for both men and women past the fifth decade of life that becomes much more pronounced as the individuals pass 70 years of age. And we also see greater losses in lower limb musculature, which is going to have a very serious implication when looking at individuals' balances and increased susceptibility to falls. There are a number of different ways that we can assess sarcopenia in an elderly population. Gold standard is without question MRI imaging because of the way that connective tissue, which tends to fill in for the loss in lean muscle mass, can be identified in MRI scans. Other ways of assessing this lean muscle mass include DEXA scan, which stands for dual emission X-ray absorptiometry, taking into account that connective tissue and fat, which tends to replace the lean mass, will have uh, different absorption abilities. There's bioelectrical impedance, looking at an electrical current that's conducted across the soft tissues. And a very simple way would be limb girth, but with an increase in subcutaneous fat, this is gonna be much more active inaccurate in the long run. There are a few ways of reporting lean muscle mass in a population. One is relative muscle mass, where we take the lean muscle mass as determined through one of these measures and divide it by height squared. Um, another one that is probably a bit more accurate would be the skeletal muscle index, which is lean muscle mass divided by total muscle mass in these populations. There's also issues with defining sarcopenia because there's different standards that are used by different um, clinics. But typically we have two different classes, class one being greater than one standard deviation below the average adult values, class two being two standard deviations below average adult values. And these are also gender specific. Another term that is used in the description of muscle tissue is dynapenia. Now, this is specifically related to loss of strength. You would think that this would be incredibly strongly related to sarcopenia, but this is not actually the case. We actually notice a strength loss that is two to five times greater compared to what would be expected just by looking at sarcopenia alone. As you can see, a number of factors are going into play here both neurological and related to the muscle tissue itself that is independent of the overall loss in mean muscle, mean muscle mass. This tends to be a much better predictor of, morbidity, of morbidity and mortality in an elderly population than sarcopenia. And what we notice is that measures that look at grip strength, which is a measure of overall strength of muscle, is much stronger associated with increased morbidity, increased hospitalization, mortality, than in looking at sarcopenia alone. So there does seem to be stuff happening at the muscular level that sarcopenia can't account for, which is important uh, taken into consideration when looking at all the overall clinical aspects for this patient population. We, there's also been studies done that look at knee extension strength. And once again, a low ex knee extension strength is a very strong correlate to morbidity morbidity and mortality in this patient population. Some 
other differences that we note in this population. First of all, we have an overall decrease in power, which is not unexpected when we look at dynopenia, but we also see a slowing in the contraction rate of the overall muscles. And this is due to a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's believed that there's a decrease in actin sliding velocity in all of the different fiber types. But as we're about to discuss, there's also an increase in the total number of slow twitch muscle fibers. Looking specifically at the muscle fibers themselves, we have a total decrease in myosin concentration within a Gissin muscle fiber that is independent on overall cross-sectional area, which suggests a greater loss of strength than could be predicted by um, decreased cross-sectional area alone. We also see fiber shortening over time, which is going to decrease the total number of sarcomeres in series. And in looking at the myonuclei, we have a total decrease in the satellite cell numbers, which means there's probably less regenerative capacity for the muscle tissue. And there's also evidence to suggest that there's a decrease in myonuclear domain size, which is suggesting that each myonuclei is less efficient with protein production. We also see denervation atrophy with age. And this is a loss of muscle fiber number that is correlated with a loss in alpha motor neurons. The thought is that we have alpha motor neurons that are dying off and because they're no longer able to distribute neurotrophic factors at the neuromuscular junction, which typically happens, we also see a commitment increase in apoptosis within a fiber population. This is typically greater effects on type 2 muscles. Here we see a stain for type 2 muscle fibers where we can see selective atrophy and loss within the type 2 fiber population in an older individual. Another interesting phenomenon is known as fiber sparing where some of these fibers that lose their alpha motor neuron can be adopted into a surviving motor unit. What is thought to happen is that when a muscle fiber loses its alpha motor neuron connection, it can essentially more or less send out a distress call that triggers axonal sprouting from surrounding unaffected alpha motor neurons. And if the sprouting is successful, then the orphan fiber will receive a new axon terminus from the adoptive alpha motor neuron. Consequently, the orphan fibers will over time take on the characteristics of the adopting motor unit. So if a type two fiber has lost its alpha motor neuron and is now adopted by a type 1 motor unit, then over time this type 2 fiber will turn into a type 1 fiber. So this creates an interesting phenomenon where we start to see more grouping patterns of fibers together because uh, surviving alpha motor neurons, which will all be of the same type, will take over and adopt the muscle fibers that have been lost by other motor units. So as a result, we see a loss in the checkerboard appearance that is typically noted with muscle, and we see much greater grouping of slow and fast twitch fibers together. Finally, we do see a number of hormonal changes, which is thought to have an effect on muscle tissue over time. We'll see decreases in androgens and growth hormones with age. And this is going to have, this is a misprint that should say catabolic effects on muscle tissue or the androgens and growth hormone typically have an anabolic effect on muscle tissue. So their loss is going to result in muscle fiber atrophy over time. We also see higher levels of IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha and that's thought to have a downregulation of IGF-1, which is also known to be a potent stimulus of muscle hypertrophy. 
So this is likely to have an effect on starcopenia and dynopenia, but the direct link has not been fully established. The final takeaway from this is that we see these negative physiological effects as described on bone density, on the quality of cartilage, the quality of tendons and increased uh, susceptibility to injury. Same thing with the ligaments, degeneration of our intervertebral discs, and a loss in skeletal muscle mass and skeletal muscle power production, which means an increase in weakness. All of these factors together demonstrate that there are physiological effects of aging that the elderly population are really stuck with and have limited amounts that they're able to do with. So as you continue with the geriatric patient population and medical considerations of the geriatric patient population, try to keep these physiological effects in mind and appreciate that as you work with this patient population, there's only so much that they can be expected to do.